Good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. If you're out of the, out of the lobby, come and join us for worship. Let's sing, off. Let's sing this together. Your love is strong and mighty. It's jealousy unyielding. It burns for me like a fire untamed. Your love is all consuming. You never stop pursuing. Nothing I could face could take it away. Oh. me 
it's not that we're here. It's only by this grace that we're breathing in here or alive. Turn to somebody next to you and say, hey, good morning. We're glad you're here. Again, welcome to Journey Church. As you're here in person or you're online, we're so glad you're here. You know, I want to read this from uh, Psalm 95, verses 1 through 6. And it's a psalm of thanksgiving. It's a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of exaltation. So as we listen, as we, as we read these words on the screen, let's, give, let's have a heart posture of worship to our great God. So let me read this for us. It says this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let us kneel, let us worship the God of all creation, the God who made the skies and the seas, the God who made us, the God who made all the animals of the earth, the God who gave us breath of life. That's the kind of God we serve. So let's give him a praise as we sing this next song. Amen.
sing praises to the one who's great. Let's sing these together. the breath that we have. that lay between us how 
hide the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah! Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Thank you, Jesus. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior. I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. With all we've got, and hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. Amen. Take the morning that seal the promise. Your very body began to It's grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You Jesus.
You are living hope, God. Jesus, you are the living hope that we hold on to. God, we serve you who's not dead, but who's living. And to that response, God, we worship you. We adore you. We gaze upon your beauty for who you are. God, let your name be glorified in every aspect of our lives, in our breathing, in our blinking, in our eating, in the workplaces. And the friends that we have, let your name be glorified. God, speak to us today through your word. Convict us to become more and more like you, to be holy, to be set apart. God, we love you so much. We give you all the praise and honor. This in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for singing with us. Let's continue in worship. Journey Church. Good morning to those of you watching online as well. Uh, do not adjust your set and do not be confused. We are not starting the Read Your Bible series back over again. If you've been here a while, you'll understand that. First of all, I wanted to ask you, do you like my shirt? I picked it out myself. Um, okay. I'm done with that part of the routine. I'll be here all week. Uh, <laughs> It is good to see you this morning as we continue on in the Why Behind the What series, and I have the privilege of bringing the message this morning, and I'm excited about today's message. When Matt asked me about this a month or so ago, and we were talking about the series, I love this type of message because I think it's important that we as believers dig into the why behind the what. We, we do all these things, and we don't know why, and I think this week, especially with a lot of the stuff that's been going on in the world, and... If you follow me on Facebook, you probably saw that I posted something on Friday that said today might be a good idea, or today might be a good day to consider what's more important to you, your witness or your opinion. And I I firmly believe that. You don't have to clap, but thank you. (laughs) And besides, it was just one of you, and that's embarrassing because nobody else. Um, But think about issues that we face in society. There are a lot of things we know the what. We believe this way, but why do we believe that? And so as we dig in today, I have the privilege of bringing a message that is not going to be one of those existential type messages where we talk about theories and abstract things. I get to basically bring the children's sermon of this series. And uh, I like that because when I was in full-time ministry, I had to do children's sermons. We always use props. We have those today. I'm very excited about that. But one thing that I want to encourage you as we delve deeper into this, and one thing that I've always loved that is the part of the culture of this church, is we are not afraid of questions. Please, please, please feel free to ask questions. If you have a question, we have a phone number, you can email, you can text those questions. Those sometimes work their way into a podcast later in the week. They sometimes work their way into a whole sermon series. You never know what your question might spark, and you never know how your question may benefit someone else who is thinking the same thing but was afraid to ask the question. So as we continue on today in this Why Behind the What series, today we're going to be talking about sacraments, but before I get into that, I want to refresh you, sort of bring you up to speed of where we are. And Chris kicked this off two Sundays ago and did a great job as he talked about some stuff. But one of the things that he mentioned that to me drove this home was most of us have an idea of the what, but are either indifferent or confused about the why. And that leads us to silence. And if there's anything we as Christians do not need to be in today's society, we do not need to be silent, but we also need to be very careful when we speak up. And the more educated we are, the more in touch we are with God and our relationship with him, the deeper that faith goes, the more 
we are better to speak from a position of being well equipped and not just to speak our truth but to speak God's truth and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us to impact the lives of those around us because I'm going to give you a little something extra now that doesn't go with the rest of the message but in light of everything going on in the world today let me remind you as believers our job is not to convict people of their sin that's the Holy Spirit's job and he does a really good job of it I know from personal experience okay so let's just leave that there so we talked about that and then carrying that why a little further is um, as Christians our why must be defined by God's Word let's read that again our why must be defined by God's Word and I'm gonna take that a little farther than that not just defined by God's Word but defined by the entirety of God's Word the best thing that we have, the best tool available for us to interpret Scripture is Scripture itself and the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. But in order to do that, we cannot take one small thing because I can promise you this. If you have something that you believe in, some position that you want to take, you can take God's Word and you can go in there and you can find a small passage that will justify your belief. If you do not believe me, go back and look at history. We justified slavery through Scripture. We justify a whole lot of things that if you look at one small thing, it does not teach us that that is what God's will is for our world. So be very careful with that. So with that in mind, Chris kicked us off in the first week talking about two things, salvation and eternal security and he did a great job with those if you have not had a chance to see that message please go back it's online watch it it is very much worth your while to spend time watching that because these are foundation blocks for our faith as believers if you don't understand what it means to have salvation how can you know if you have salvation and if you don't understand eternal security you don't understand that it's God who saves us not we ourselves that it's a free gift of God and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as we get deeper in this today too and then Matt last week got to talk about the highbrow theological topic of sanctification and did an excellent job with that and I'm not gonna to try to rehash that because I'm not that smart go back and watch it again so that leads us to like I said the children's sermon of the series today we're going to be talking about the sacraments how many of you have even heard that word before sacraments okay now what brand of Christianity what type of church are you most likely to hear that word in Catholic, catholic that's correct so I want to make sure that we all understand that and we're not going to become catholic today nothing against our catholic brothers and sisters watching y'all got your cross to bear too we you know we'll deal with that later not my not my message today but as we talk about sac sacraments we do have sacraments that we participate in in the protestant church and believe it or not we would still kind of be considered protestant even though we don't have a subtitle on our sign outside in fact we don't even have a sign outside um, so <laughs> believe me from somebody that came out of years of full-time Christian service I'm thankful for that because a lot of times the sign outside had those things where you had to put messages on them and it wasn't the digitized thing that you could just sit on a computer it was oh it's 105 degrees Randy go change the sign type thing um, incidentally the last church that I was at that had that after I left the church it was like four or five years before they ever even really changed what was on the sign so you know, who knows all right but here's what we say sacraments are here's our working definition that we're gonna work off of today Christian rite or ritual that is believed to have been ordained by Christ and next slide and that is held to be a means of divine grace or to be a sign or a symbol of spiritual of a spiritual reality okay now the reason I have sign or symbol highlighted there is because I want to make sure we get one thing straight uh, that first part of this that is held to be a means of divine grace in journey church and I made sure I called Matt and talked to him about this because I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page <clears throat> but we do not believe that these sacraments in any way depart any type of divine grace to us in other words the best way to put that is these things aren't magic okay because we kind of get caught up in that sometimes and we think that this is something that if we do it something special happens to us being baptized does not make you a Christian taking a communion taking the Lord's Supper does not make you a Christian and the easiest way I can illustrate this and it's something I feel like I always have to address every time and I don't understand this because I am a Charlotte native but 
I'm the one around the office when I'm in the office that gets picked on because of my accent. The Canadian picks on me. <laughs> Even worse, the Yankee from Michigan that used to be on staff, Don, I hope you're watching, I love you, you're a dear friend, used to really ride me about it. I'm like, guys, I'm the one from here. I do not have the accent. You guys have the accent. Okay, you can clap for that. That's worth clapping for. Okay. But here's the point I'm getting, trying to make with this thing about these things do not make you a Christian. I do not have this accent in order to be Southern. I have this accent because I am Southern. Does that make sense? Okay. We do not do these things to become a Christian. We do these things because we are a Christian. So if you take anything away from that today, let that sort of sit there and realize that these are not magical. If you want to see a magic show, I can work that out for you too. That's a whole different story, but again, this is not a magic show today. This is a message to hopefully bring us more in touch with how Christ wants to work in and through us to help us better live out our faith in the public forum. Okay, so with that in mind, when we talk about the sacraments, um, there are if you look at the Catholic Church or the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church, uh, these would be the sacraments that would most likely be the ones that they would say are part of their process of liturgy. Baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist or communion, and that, that's a different word, and there's another word that we can always throw in there too, and we're going to talk about that today, the Lord's Supper. Those are all three basically. The same thing, penance. Uh, the anointing of the sick, marriage, and holy orders. Now, while we're going to focus on baptism and communion today, I will say that um, we do still believe that anointing of the sick is a thing. Uh, you know, if you were sick and you wanted the elders or people in the church to come anoint you and pray for you, you can talk to Matt. We'll be glad to do that. If you ever want to hear a really funny story about that, I will be glad to tell you, but I'm not going to share that one from up here today. Obviously, we still believe in marriage. And um, this bottom one, holy orders or ordination, we don't have deacons in our church, but in churches where you have deacons, you have elders, people that are going into the ministry. They have a process to which we call being ordained. I went through it in order to become a pastor. Um, and it's not just a matter, of, if you've ever been to an ordination service, the, the person that's being ordained a lot of times, will, they'll put them in a chair down front and all the like deacons in the church, or it's different for every church, but they'll come, they'll lay hands on them, they'll pray for them. It is a very moving time it really is and it happened many many years ago for me and I still remember that but then they also the way we also describe it sometimes in the behind the curtain thing is empty heads on empty hands or empty hands on empty heads because that's the way it can feel like sometimes but we do ordination still that's important if we had someone that was going said they feel called into the ministry we would ordain that person to go out and to fulfill that calling in their life so with those in mind the two that we're going to talk about today as I've already mentioned are baptism and communion or the Lord's Supper. Now, I'm going to address the elephant in the room because some of you are wondering, what on earth is this? We are going to have at the end of the service full blown, traditional, for lack of a better term, Southern Baptist communion. <laughs> so, under this tablecloth is not a dead body or anything like that. We have the elements for the Lord's Supper we have the bread and we have the juice. We also have a gluten-free option. I'll talk about that more, but I'm saying that more not to remind you, but to remind me when we get to that point. But uh, that's what this is all about, so forget about that until we get to that time, and let's focus on what's happening up here. So, baptism and the Lord's Supper, uh, two very important sacraments, two very important things that we celebrate in the church. And I want to make sure you understand that word, we celebrate those things. And the reason we celebrate them is, you know, they're important within our Christian life. They're important within the communal life of the church and that ecclesia that we have to help us build community. But to get a little bit better understanding of what we're talking about, these are rituals, okay? This is one of the what things. All these that we talk about, whether they're the two we're focusing on today or any of the others, are rituals. And a ritual, again, referring to the dictionary, we will go to Scripture after a while, I promise, a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. Now, I'm going to sit here for just a second because this really gets me into my children's sermon part of today. Because not only is this communion table set up so that we can have communion, but it also hides my prop for today. Yeah, baby. Uh, <laughs> okay, you're right. This is a golf club. My loving wife, who I love dearly, got me this as a Christmas present. 
because I've been trying to be better at playing golf. How many golfers do we have in the house? Okay. As a side note for this, I'm always available for play dates. Um, so I have played golf for a long, long time. Uh, predates Don and I dating, which predates a lot of you in here. But I've never been that great at it. I've always been that golfer that would usually shoot around 100 to 103. And I just got tired of doing that. And back last year, I was playing golf with a buddy of mine, and he got a new driver. And he let me hit the driver, and I realized that I was hitting it really well. And part of the reason was the last new set of clubs that I bought, I bought before our son was born. Our son will turn 27 a week from tomorrow. Uh, technology has changed since then. And so I started hitting my buddy Steve's driver, and I was hitting it really well, and I was just telling Donna about it. Well, Donna got in touch with Steve, found out what type of driver it was, and Christmas morning I go and I open up what I thought were all my presents, and she's like, oh, wait, but wait, there's more. You know, it's like the thing on TV. And so she says, look behind the door in your office. Great place to hide things in my office. I rarely go in there. Um, <laughs> she hit it not for Christmas. But I go and I pull out the, this box, and... It's a brand new driver. Now, a little bit of a side note to that, the one that she got me, which was just like my buddy's, I opened it up and I got to looking at it and it was broken. Uh, it, she got it from Dix, no reflection on Dix, love Dix, they do great things, they take good care of me all the time with that, but it, she had ordered it online, it, it had gotten shipped from a warehouse somewhere, they'd never even taken a look at it, and the top of the graphite or a carbon fiber head was cracked, so next day I went to Dix, told them about it, they were willing to make it good, but they did not have another one of those. So I called Don, I said, they don't have another one. I said, they all have this one, but it's more than the one you bought me. And again, my loving wife, who always knows what to say, said, well, you can't not have a Christmas present. Just get it. So I did. All right. <laughs> now, just having this did not make me a better golfer. I had to really sit down and analyze what I was doing in golf. And one of the things that I found out was that I did not have a pre-shot ritual. When you're standing on the tee box or you're standing over the ball in the fairway or you're getting ready to putt. And if you golf, you understand what I'm talking about. So even with this brand new amazing club that hits the ball straighter than I've ever hit a ball before, one thing I realized that if I didn't have a pre-shot ritual, I might be hitting the ball straight, but I'd be hitting it straight into the woods. <laughs> so got to, do, got to do my research and found out, okay, what do I need to do? And I found this pre-shot ritual that works for me. And I, I'm not going to hit a golf ball. Please don't be afraid in the center section. Although Shin did mention wanting a new TV in the back. I can make that happen uh, if you want to. But it, I started watching this and the first thing I realized is I was not teeing the ball up at a consistent height, which is important for these oversized drivers. So I went out and I thought, well, how can I make that better? So I found these tees. I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but they've got lines on them. And I bought like 500 of these things. And I went to the driving range and I figured out what height I needed the tee at in order to hit the ball consistently and I discovered that if I stick it in to where that second from the bottom line is in the ground and put the ball on it that's where I tee it up every time all right that's not enough though and I'm not going to tee that up I'm not going to do that but the other thing like I said I could hit it straight in the woods I figured out my alignment was wrong and if you play golf you know that's a big thing so I found out that if I tee my ball up to the second line on the tee and then I stand on the tee and I look where I'm aiming my ball and I hold my club out and close my left eye. Yeah, that's part of it. And line the ball up with where I'm aiming the ball because I have trouble aiming 300 yards away at something. But I look along the shaft of where I'm aiming about three feet in front of me and I pick out a piece of grass, a broken piece of tee, a spot in the dirt, whatever. And that becomes my aiming point. So when I stand over the ball and I grab the club, Instead of looking way down there, now my ball's already at the right height it needs to be, and by the way, I'm not charging extra for the golf lesson today, in case you're wondering. Okay, but I put that up there, I line up, I make sure I'm aiming at the spot that I've got there, and here's the kicker. The very last thing that I do before I swing the club is I tell myself one simple word, relax. Who said don't do it? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. I say relax, because I realized all these years everything was so tense. So I relax that, I take a nice even backswing, and about two months ago I played Goodyear Country Club up in Virginia with a buddy of mine for the first time in all my years of playing golf. When I putted the ball into the hole on the 18th green, the ball that I putted with was the exact same ball that I started with on tee number one. I was proud of that. 
And my other thing was, when I started this, like I said, I was shooting around 100 to 105. I'm averaging in the high 80s now. My handicap is now 16. Why? Because I've developed a ritual that means something. I've developed a ritual that helps me accomplish something that I wanted to accomplish. And the reason I say that is because as we get into these sacraments, as we get into these rituals, they have to serve a purpose. We're not talking about superstition. And the best illustration I can give for that is, and guys, you know this, because you do it whether you want to admit it or not. I'm just the only one that's going to stand up in front of you and say this. You've got your sports team that you like, and you've got your jersey that you wear every time they're on a winning streak, and you're going to wear that jersey every time because you think if you don't wear that jersey, they're not going to play well. Or, And I admit, like I said, I've done it. I, I love to watch Carolina Tar Heel basketball, and I'll be sitting there watching. Duke fans, just be quiet. Um, <laughs> We went to we won the championship this year, not the one not the one on Monday night, the one on Saturday night that y'all lost. It's a whole different thing. Uh, <laughs> don't clap for that, please. I don't want to. We talk about division in the church. That's not one I want to start today. But yeah, there have been times I'll be watching a basketball game, and my wife will tell you a lot of times I like to stand up while I'm doing it, and I've got the stress reliever ball that I'll keep in my hand because I can get. A, I know you have trouble believing this. I can get a little animated at times. In the old days, I would throw things at the TV, but that's when they had that big picture tube and you couldn't break them. You can't throw things at this new stuff. So I got this, but I, this ball I squeeze, but I'll stand up through the whole first half. And they played really good in the first half. You know what that means? It means I got to stand up during the second half. I know, I know, I'm not a dumb person, even though I was one of those 30 that wore the same shirt last week. I'm not a <laughs> dumb person, but we get these things in our mind. You know, it is not going to make my team play better if I stand up the second half. But when we approach these sacraments, these rituals, these religious ceremonies in a proper way, they do benefit us. They do help draw us into a closer relationship with God and a deeper understanding of the faith that we have and the faith that we are supposed to share. So that's the why behind why we do all this. Now let's dig in a little deeper. What's the, what's the why behind this well the first one that we come with especially with the ones we're going to talk about today is jesus said so now if your parents you know growing up as a kid you ask your parents something and they were frustrated with you and you were asking why you had to do this and you got what phrase because i said so and you grew up thinking that mom and dad is not a valid reason for me to do something and then you became a parent and you found out because I said so is an absolutely valid reason to do something. But we've got to go deeper than that. Yes, when we talk about baptism, we talk about communion, we're doing these things because Christ instructed us to do them. And the reason he instructed us to do them is because he knew they were going to be beneficial to their, our faith. So if we stay, take it a step farther than just because he said so, we see that these things are also, go to the next slide, the deeper why to this is there are means through which we can express and examine our faith. A means through which we can express and examine our faith. Because I really believe a life of faith that is lived unexamined is a life of faith, first of all, not worth living. But also, if we live a life of faith that's not examined, it's not going to be a life of faith that's expressed. We are not going to impact the folks around us in the way that God intends for us to as believers. So we're going to talk about baptism, first of all. Now, we could have, we actually mentioned this about what, did we have anybody need to be baptized. We talked about including baptism in with this today, but I already know I'm going to run long as it is. So as we talk about baptism, I want you to think back. How many of y'all have been here for a baptism service at Journey? My wife and I have had this conversation Journey has the best baptism services. Um, and, and I can say that because I had no part in planning any of that, and I don't get paid extra for mentioning that or anything like that. But we celebrate baptism. We celebrate that individual who has professed their faith in Christ and is willing to stand in front of a group of people and say, I am a believer. But what are we doing here? What's the what? of baptism. But what is this? The religious rite of sprinkling water onto or a person on the religious rite of sprinkling water onto a person's forehead or of immersion in water symbolizing purification 
or regeneration and admission into the Christian church. Okay, that, that's a lot. And again, that's that Merriam-Webster type de definition for that. And I'm not going to get into the sprinkling versus dunking thing today. That, to me, that's not important. Those are the things that we let divide us that aren't things that we need to let divide us. But again, baptism is not magical. Taking and putting someone under water and raising them back up does not result in them entering the kingdom of God. Putting someone under water and holding them under water, <laughs> if they are a believer, might progress their entrance into the kingdom. But again, we're not going to do that either. But if you've seen it here, you know, we have the pool set up and we bring the people forward. And what I love is the videos. Man, those things get me every time, especially the kids. And when you hear these, these young children that are so well-spoken, uh, there was one a while back and I was like, ah, oh, parent had to help them write it. And I was talking to Cole, she's like, no, wrote that whole thing. Man, I was blown away. Uh, but it's that opportunity to stand up and say, this is what we believe. This is what I believe as an individual. This is why I'm doing it, because I have accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And so, okay, Randy, you've said a lot. You've said we need to interpret Scripture with Scripture. There has to be some Scripture that talks about this. As a matter of fact, there is. So let's see what the Bible says about baptism. And this is the because I said so verse, okay? Je this is Jesus talking after his death, burial, and resurrection as he's giving some of his final instructions to his disciples. He says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Next one. There we go. Whoop. Wait a minute. Where would my scripture go? Should be another one there. What comes up after this one? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> uh, this is Paul talking to the church at Rome. And he says, Therefore we were buried with him by the baptism in the death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. So now think about this. The first one we talked about said, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This talks about we're raised again into a new way of life. Go to the next one. Uh, now this is the one that I love. Because to me, one of the main things about baptism is that it's a public form of confession. And so we're going to talk about salvation a little bit. What does it mean to be saved? Uh, Hopefully, you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Hopefully, you've had a point in time in your life when you have acknowledged that you've sinned, you're no good on your own, you can't get to heaven on your own. The only way you can get there is by accepting God's free gift of salvation. Some of you, a lot of you, most of you probably said what we call the sinner's prayer. I challenge you to find that anywhere in Scripture. It's not in there. That's just what we've developed over the years to help, I guess, clarify this. But if you want to boil it down to the rock bottom what does it mean to be saved? Romans 10, and we're going to look at 10, 9 and 10, says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Next slide. Uh, one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. Okay. What does all that mean? we got one more scripture, right? Next slide. Okay. Nope, we're going to stop there. Okay, so this is, to me, the why behind baptism. It's a public confession of our acceptance of God's free gift of salvation. It is an opportunity for the individual to stand in front of an assembled body of believers and say, this is what I've done. I have died to my old life. I'm being buried with Christ and raised again to new life in Christ. Now, everybody does it differently. All pastors have their little thing. And, you know, we have the thing that we show, which I think is awesome. But Matt or whoever's baptizing always asks, the person a question and I always did this too I would always say whoever was baptized I would say what has the Lord done for you or what has Christ done for you and what you want to hear in that is something about he saved me he's forgiven me my sins he's given me new life in Christ something that indicates they understand the commitment that they've made and then I would always say in my very best Baptist words so and so upon this confession of faith in accordance to his command I baptize you my brother or sister in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and that, that always Craig, there is a thrill that somebody that has never baptized anybody but does not understand about being the person that gets to take that person and raise, you know, put them underwater and bring them back up. And it's not that act of doing that, but it's something about the act of just getting to share in that experience in that water with them. And again, it's not magic, but in some ways it's magical, you know, just from that feeling that it gives you. So that's how I do it. Um, and that's what that's all about to me. And so I want to encourage you. Before we transition into the communion part of the service today, 
Number one, if you have confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and you've never been baptized, talk to one of the staff here. And I know, one of the things, even as a child, that held me back from making my public profession of faith, because again, I know you'll find this hard to believe, I was a very shy child. I did not like being in front of people. Uh, And the only reason I do this today is by the grace of God. That's the only reason I'm able to stand up and talk to people today. But um, one of the things that held me back, because I wanted to be saved, but I knew the way we did it, we had the invitation where you had to go down to the church, you know, go down the front of the church at the end of the service. That terrified me. And then the thought of getting up in that baptismal pool in front of everybody, oh, it it, it was a God thing. I tell you that I finally did it because I had so much to overcome with that. But if you haven't been baptized, but you know you've been saved, talk to one of us. Let's get that on the schedule. Let's get that worked out. But then the other part of that is if you've never confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Christ really is who he says he is and that what he did on the cross is the only means of payment for our sin and you'd like to make that profession of faith, please come talk to us too. I'll be in the space after this. Coffee with the pastors is going on today. I'd love to be the person that gets to talk to you and help you better understand what it means to become a Christian and to begin your walk of faith. I would, that would make my day if you did that today. So that's baptism. That's the why and the what of baptism. Now let's jump over into communion. What is communion? The what? Christian worship at which bread and wine are consecrated and shared in order to commemorate the death of Christ. Okay, now we are not sharing wine today. We're sharing grape juice. What we are sharing today is bread, but it's like the bread like most likely they had at the Passover, which is called unleavened bread. We call that today cracker. Um, (laughs) And I I will tell you this, you are not going to be impressed. Uh, It's the little tiny square. I was looking at the nutritional information. There is none whatsoever. No value nutritional wise. (laughs) Serving is one piece, no calories. And again, we do have the gluten free option. And again, I say that to remind myself. But um, I'm not gluten. I don't have a problem with gluten. I just know that if I forget, there'll be somebody here that I'll forget to get a gluten free piece of bread to today. Now, when we talk about the what, I want to rest here for just a second because we mentioned that. You know, you've got the Catholic Church, you've got the Episcopal Church, you've got the Anglican Church, and then you've got the Protestant Churches. And each one of these groups has a slightly different view of what happens when we do communion. And again, we see it as a symbol. We see it as an opportunity to do what Christ instructed us to do, to do this in remembrance of his death. But the Catholic Church believes in something called transubstantiation. And that's my big word for today, transubstantiation. Trans means across or to become. The Catholic Church actually believes that when the priest takes the bread and takes the wine and blesses it, that it actually becomes the body and blood of Christ. Still tastes like bread, still tastes like wine, but it becomes the body and blood of Christ. Now, other churches like Episcopal and Anglican believe in what we call consubstantiation. Actually, you get two big words today. Consubstantiation, those churches that follow that belief in communion or the Eucharist believe that when the priest or the minister, whoever it is, blesses it, that it doesn't transform into the blood and body of Christ, but that the elements of the blood and body of Christ are present in the bread and present with the wine at the same time. So the wine is wine, but the wine is also blood. The bread is bread, but the bread is also body. Aren't you glad we don't have to deal with that? It's cracker and juice. But it still means something. It's still important. And we got six different verses to look at for this, so bear with me on those as we look and start to delve into the why. First of all, this is uh, dealing with the Lord's Supper. When Passover is taking place and Jesus told his disciples, you know, to go get the room ready, this is in that setting. They're all reclined around the table. They've just finished the Passover meal. It says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Next one. Uh, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Now, I'm going to pause there for just a second. <clears throat> because if you've taken communion in a more traditional setting, the t we've all seen the table that sits at the front of the church, big wooden table, and it's always got this phrase. It, it, it'll say, do this in remembrance of me, or if you're real liturgical, it says, this do in remembrance of me. But that's always engraved across the front. And in most traditional churches, that table sits at the front of the church every week, and it sits there, what, whether intentionally or not, as a reminder of what Christ has done for us so that we remember that sacrifice. But that phrase is important because this is part of the why. Do this in remembrance of me. Next one. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. For as all, And this is skipping over to Corinthians. This is Paul giving instructions to the church at Corinth about why we do this. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup... You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So not only are we remembering what he did for us, we are proclaiming to those around us what he has not just done for us, but what he's done for them. Because what does scripture say? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are not part of an exclusive club. And if there's one verse that I didn't throw up here, Romans 6, 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Chris focused on that two weeks ago. And if you're wondering what the Hebrew word all means, it means all. Everybody. We all did it. None of us get out scot-free. We've all sinned. Your sin may be different than my sin, but we've all sinned and we need a Savior. And this is a way to proclaim that to those around us. Next. Okay. As we come to this time of communion, here's the things that I want you to think about as we move into this. What we're getting ready to do is a time of reflection. It's a time to reflect upon what God has done for us, is doing for us, and will do for us. This is not just about something that happened. It's about something that is happening and it's about something that will continue to happen. Not just continue to happen until Christ comes back, but will continue to happen for all of eternity. Because if you jump back two weeks and look at Chris's message, if you are saved, you are saved. And there is nothing that can take that away. So we will be celebrating with Christ through all of eternity. So now, a little bit of nuts and bolts about what's going to be going on here so that you are not confused. Wait a minute. Okay, I can put that up. Um, We're going to uncover this table in just a second. And I've got six guys that are going to be assisting with me. So if you guys would go ahead and make your way to the front and come on down here. We don't have deacons, so we just had to get volunteers and one conscripted individual that didn't know until he got here today. Again, thanks, Tim. We appreciate that. But what we're going to do in this is Matt and I are going to uncover this tablecloth. And I've got a little book under there called the Pastor's Manual. Yes, there is. That. Pastoring does come with a manual. And I have it there. And I promise I'm going to transition to a more solemn, serious, sincere time. I know that's not my nature if you're around me all the time, but I can be that way. But when we get into this, I'm going to give these guys, first of all, a plate that has the little pieces of bread in it. And they're going to spread out, and they're going to pass it to you. There's going to be one at each end of the row, and they're going to hand it to you. You're going to take that, and you're going to hand it to the next individual after you get your cracker out, and so on and so forth. And there'll be somebody at the other end of the aisle, one of these guys, to pick it up pass it to the next aisle. This is important. It's not just an efficient way to get this distributed because when the person on the end hands that to you, you have to go through the act of receiving it. You have to take that. Also, when that person hands that to you, they're serving you. And when you take it and once you've got it, you're going to hand it and serve it to the next person because one of the things Christ calls us to do is to serve each other. So this is a way of doing that this morning. So we'll do that with the bread, and I'll read a little passage, and Matt's going to say a prayer, and then I'll say another little thing, and we'll eat the bread. And I'm just laying this out so you know, so you're not trying to figure out what do I do next, what do I do next. Uh, then I will hand out the trays that have the juice in them, and we'll do the same thing. They'll distribute them amongst them. Now, there are, here's the thing. These trays only hold 40 cups in each one. Stan, did you get a chance to kind of figure out the math one? Over 40, over 50. We're not talking about your age. Um, okay. 
we're going to have to do some logistical things here, but here's, I'm going to give instructions for these guys. You two in the center, when you finish up, uh, you said 50 over here. If you have some left in yours, you start at the back over here and serve forward till you catch up with each other or we run out. Uh, for you guys that are over here, if you run out, just come forward. I have another tray. That, and we'll, everybody will get something. It, it just may take us a while because we're not versed in this. I mean, it, this is the first time we've done this. We don't know how it will turn out. So with that in mind, let's have communion. Okay, got it. Okay. Man of sorrow, Lamb of God, by His own. been on Jesus' place. Silence as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned. Bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah. In honor on to thee. Set of heaven, God's own son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very. Who nailed him to that tree? Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor. debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus filled. Now the curse of sin has no hold 
Christ said, and when the hour had come, he said at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I shall not eat, or I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after supper, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Now we leave some prayer. Let's pray together. Let's pray together before we partake, okay? Father God, we are so grateful as we hear those words, your body was broken for us. And God, while we eat this, we we remember that. We remember your that you bore the wounds, you, you bore the stripes for our transgressions, for our sin, you were broken. And God, that our gratitude is, is that it's not in our strength, it's not in our body that we save ourselves. It's not in our strength and in our body that we now have to wear the, the wages of sin. But God, because of you, because of you, sacrificing yourself for us, God, and your body was broken for us. We're so thankful that you saved us. And right now, we do this in remembrance of you, God. And we thank you for what you have done. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Take, eat ye all.
Let's pray together. Again, Jesus, we do this in remembrance of you. We're so thankful for the blood that was shed again for us. That your body was broken, but that your blood that covers our sins, as scripture tells us, was shed on our behalf. Jesus, it's not because we earned it. It's not because we were worth it. It's not because we achieved anything. It was your gift to help restore that relationship that we are now allowed to have with you. So we do this in remembrance and we say thank you, Jesus. In Hebrews we read, Indeed, under the law, most everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Take the drink of y'all. Now in just a second, we're going to sing a hymn, because if we're going to do this traditionally, we might as well do the whole thing. But here's the one thing, and here's the reason I wanted us to do all of this today. Is there a more efficient way of doing this? Yes. Are there other ways to do it that are just as effective? Yes. I will tell you that the Good Friday service that we had before, right before Easter this year is one of the most meaningful communion services I've ever been a part of. But the reason I wanted us to do it this way today is because of this little plastic cup. If you'll take and look at that cup, you'll notice there's still a little bit of that juice in the bottom in there. Don't try to suck it out because I know some of you are thinking. Here's your assignment for this week, for this month, for this year, forever how long. Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. This is your take-home souvenir today. As you take this home, that little bit of juice is going to dry in the bottom of that. And it's going to serve as a constant reminder of the blood that Christ shed for us. I want you to take it Put it on your nightstand, your vanity, wherever. There's a place that you're going to see it every day to remember what he did for us. Because that is why we do those things. The more we remember, the more we appreciate, and the more we proclaim. We're going to sing that song that Shen promised us. Huh? Yeah, you got the doxology? Oh, man, we're going full bore tradition. Yes. Some of you may not have a clue what this song is. Take it away, Shin. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Sing that one more time. Praise Father, whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. As we prepare to leave today, do me one last favor. Use these things that we've talked about today as an opportunity to remember who you are in Christ, but also who Christ is in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to come together. We thank you for the time we've had to remember what you've done for us even though we don't deserve it. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you'll help us to take these things and use them as things to strengthen our faith, to grow in our relationship with you, but also to better equip us to prepare us to go out and to share with the world that needs to know that there is love and there is a God that loves them unconditionally. Use us as that example, and we'll give you the praise for it all. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, guys.
Would you guys thank Randy for us? And uh, I'm supposed to go this place. It was such a joy to be able to, to take in this and to um, uh, remember. Again, the, 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 we, don't, we don't intentionally shun traditions, but we never want to engage in these things if we can't explain to you why we do them and why it's important. And just remember as a church, um, because we do this every so often. We do it as a, as a church when we get together for partner nights. Uh, but we have communion available for you every weekend. All right, That's what they're there for in the back and at the front. Because we want people who know what it means to be able to partake and to receive when they want to. When, they, when they're having that, as Randy said, that opportunity to reflect and remember what Christ has done for you. So just know that's one of the reasons we make it available for you every single week so that you can make this a practice, a ritual uh, in your life that means something, all right? Uh, very quickly, just because I've got a couple things to give you before I dismiss you, all right? Um, today, if you're new, please come and visit us uh, at the Coffee with Pastors. Uh, you can go to the Nudie Journey area or to the back. We're going to be uh, back in the uh, cafe area. We'd love to meet you. Again, if you have any questions about your faith, you can talk to Randy in the space as well. Um, and we want to thank you for those who give financially to Journey, to the mission and ministry of our church. You can do that online. You can do that through the tall wooden boxes at the back of the room and at the doors as well. All right. And then uh, I do want to make you aware of two things. Um, one big one is that we are starting uh, the registrations for one of our first mission trips, one of our first mission projects that we get to participate in since COVID. And that's a big deal for us. And we're going to be going back to serve with uh, Appalachian Service Project, ASP, you've heard us call it. Um, we're going to go back and serve with them this fall in October. And uh, there's cards at the table and registrations and, or, you know, you can fill it out to fill out applications and all that stuff. But I want to just very quickly quickly show you what we do and how we serve uh, with ASP. Let's watch this together. When gasoline prices rise, I make one less trip to Starbucks or something. A family living in central Appalachia is living in poverty. The first thing they usually put off is maintenance on their home. I truly am disabled. We can't afford to go out and fix the things we truly need to fix, not with my resources, nor with the knowledge I had. I have seen homeowners who weren't able to get to the hospital because they didn't have a safe way to get out of their house. It was just so unsafe, and it was so hard to heat. And then you walk on the bedroom floor, it was just like walking on a trampoline or something. We wouldn't even let people come in our old house. Somebody come visit, we wouldn't meet them on the porch. The solution is to fix their homes, to make their homes warm, safe, and dry, where families don't have resources. And those two resources would be materials to do the repairs and other people reaching out in love and care to come and to do the work. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people that serve with ASP every year. They're praying for us. They're raising money for their youth to come serve with us. This kind of work changes lives in a way that's immeasurable. I feel like I've gained a lot of friendship from the experience and I really thank God for that. Memories of helping someone else, getting to know someone else, that's something that stays with you. And that's what I'm gonna remember. I love every one of them, you know? They're God sent. They really are. ASP has been in existence for over 50 years, and we have affected a lot of lives. ASP, they, they changed their whole life. I mean, they really did. It's amazing what these people do. I wish everyone could experience this, whether it's for a weekend or a week. I'm so glad there's programs like ASP that allow us to walk the talk. ASP just makes faith come alive in very powerful ways. A roof is something that is easy to fix. When that roof gives a family a chance to play and learn and love and laugh together, 
we've done something that is of cosmic importance. Going back with all of our Journey Go um, Global Outreach partners, but but being able to return to Tennessee, hopefully to West Virginia one day, and continue to serve with ASP is a huge deal for us as a church, and we're really excited about going back this year. So, uh, for those of you that signed up an uh, interest form earlier in the year, you were interested in it. You're going to get an email about this uh, this coming week, but you can also get the cards and the information at the info bar today. Uh, next week and the following week. But we only have three more weeks uh, before your registration uh, application is due, and we're starting the process on what team we're taking and going uh, up to. It's in October. I think it's the 25th, 26th. I'm not sure on that first day, but I know it goes to the 30th. Um, and so just look at the times, look and see if that's something you and your family might be able to be interested in doing. Ask the questions you need to ask at the info bar uh, with any of the folks here. Our staff will be glad to get you the information you need. Uh, but that's that registration is happening right now. We're kicking that off this week. OK. And then lastly, I wanted to make sure you knew about this because I didn't honestly know uh, our B3 group, our men's B3 uh, was we do events throughout the year. Sometimes there's fun things going on. And Nate uh, uh, brought up the fact that there was a, a rodeo happening over in Concord the, at the Stigall Arena. And so some of our B3 men were going, and they were inviting families and saying it's a re it really is a family fun event uh, tonight. I know it's short notice for some of you, but tonight, if you didn't know. Uh, but I did find out yesterday that this is the last week of the rodeo in Concord, that actually it's going to be shutting down. Um, the owner of the arena passed away, and this is the last season that they're going to have it here. And so, again, I know it's short notice, but I know it's an amazing event for families. If you want that, you were emailed the information about it today. You were emailed about it this morning before you came to church. If you didn't get the email, see us at the info bar. We'll be glad to give you that information. But that's happening tonight. I think the last official last weekend is next weekend, but just wanted you to know that window is closing if that's something you wanted to do uh, with you and your family. All right? Uh, guys, this has been an amazing Sunday. Thank you so much for coming and participating in it. We are going to continue. I think we're closing out the why behind the what series next week. And I love you guys. Thank you so much for coming, and I'll see you guys next Sunday. Thanks. <laughs>